Welcome to everybody and um, welcome to Samaritan Counseling Center of the Fox Valley's uh, first webinar of the season. It is called Everyday Mindfulness and um, a little bit about Samaritan. We, um, Samaritan has served the uh, Fox Valley with uh, professional counselors for 50 years now. This is our 50th year and so we're very pleased to be here and to welcome you all today. My name is Dee Savides. I am a licensed clinical uh, social worker here at Samaritan and I've been here about 12 years and been in practice for about, um, about 29 years now. So I'm very happy to present this for you today. Um, let's see if I can move my slide forward. So, Mindfulness. Let me just start by saying uh, mindfulness practices have been uh, with us over the ages and they're part of many major religions, including Christianity, Buddhism, um, Islam, Native American spiritual practices, many kinds of spiritual practices. Um, there is excellent research to show that um, mindfulness is effective at reducing anxiety and depression. It is actually, uh, studies show it's effective at um, encouraging people to be compassionate with themselves and with others, and it actually increases empathy. So why don't we do it? <laughs> I think part of the reason that we don't do it is that we're daunted. We're daunted by um, the examples of people who can uh, sit and meditate for an hour, and then we try to do it for five minutes and find ourselves uh, feeling like a failure. And so a lot of people give up on mindfulness, which is why I decided to do this, uh, this webinar, is because I wanted to provide people with an opportunity to learn some really simple everyday ways to incorporate mindfulness into your everyday life. Um, simple is not easy, by the way. Simple is just simple. Um, every now and then I'm, I'm joining other people into the, into the room. So if you hear the ding, that's what's happening. Why do we need mindfulness? Well, our species evolved and survived because we were able to detect threat. We were able to see threat in the environment and to marshal our responses to it, usually by the means of the fight or flight response, which is where uh, your body uh, rallies to give you the, the um, increased adrenaline and um, heart pumping and uh, sweat glands working to help you fight and win a fight or to run away or to freeze and to not be seen. Fight, flight, or freeze, it's called. And so, um, the problem is, is that, that those processes, while they helped us to survive, they also, um, they also come up when we don't need them. And we have a tendency to go into fight or flight kind of regularly when there's no fire going on and the fire alarm's going off. Um, when we're flooded with anxiety so much of the time, um, we become less resilient and less effective at what we're trying to do. And we also, um, find ourselves overemphasizing the doing mode of life, the doing mode being the, the part of life where we're accomplishing things and we're, um, we're seeing progress and we're looking forward and we're wanting to see uh, results from what we're doing versus the being mode, which is simply sitting back and allowing ourselves to appreciate what's right in front of us. Uh, our society has become way overbalanced. We are very much overemphasizing the doing mode. And then we start to focus on things that are not in our control and trying to control them. Well, that doesn't work very well in a pandemic because here we are with <laughs> virtually everything outside of our control, it feels like some days. And so that's another reason why mindf mindfulness tools can be helpful. I wanna say something about what mindfulness is not. It is not your mind going blank. It is not not feeling. It is not being in continuous bliss or, or just not thinking. In fact, 
when we're truly mindful, we are able to um, observe our thoughts and feelings quite efficiently. Um, so it's not that they go blank, and we'll learn more about that in a minute. One of the key skills in mindfulness, and I'm sure many of you know how to do this, but I'm just going to tell you anyway, because it's such a critical part of mindfulness, and that's your diaphragm, your belly breathing. So I'm going to ask you from where you're sitting right now to put your hand on your, um, on your belly right around where the, uh, the navel is, and just feel that gentle rise and fall as you breathe in, and you breathe out. I often ask people to breathe out as though they're breathing through a straw, like with pursed lips. And what that does is it helps you regulate your out breath so that your out breath can be just a little bit longer than your in breath and it keeps you from hyperventilating. So slow in through your nose, slow out through your mouth, making that out breath a little bit longer than the in breath. Um, let me explain to you what's happening inside your body. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve, which um, is responsible for the, um, the relaxation response in your body. So when your diaphragm is pressing against that vagus nerve, it actually inspires your body to let go and relax. And that's why the belly breathing is so important. If you're not sure if you're doing belly breathing and you don't know how to do it, Try lying on the floor or on your bed and put a book on your belly, on your lower abdomen, and just watch the rise and fall of the book as you're breathing, because when you're, when you're lying down, you tend to breathe normally, the, the healthy way, um, versus holding your breath or doing shallow chest breathing. And that will just kind of guide you into what it feels like to do diaphragm breathing. Um, Many of the, of the mindfulness experts say, follow your in-breath all the way to the end of your in-breath and follow your out-breath all the way to the end of your out-breath. And that counts as one breath. And if you do that, counting your breaths, let's say up to 10, and if you lose count, start over at one. If you can do that all the way up to 10, it gives you a good little tiny spell of mindfulness that can re-regulate your body. So that's one tool that you can have. Another one is beach ball breathing. Can you see me? I can't see myself, so I'm not sure. Thumbs up if you can see me. Okay, so beach ball breathing is where your hands are gonna show what your abdomen is doing. So if you're breathing in, your hands follow like this. Breathing out. It's almost like your hands are just expressing what your, what your belly is doing. And the hands follow the breath, they don't leave. And so that's called beach ball breathing. And that's a good one for centering into your body when you're having a hard time re-regulating and you're getting very stressed out, is have your hands follow. It engages just like a whole bunch of senses there to make sure that you're doing the right kind of breathing. Um, another, another key that m many, uh, mindfulness experts recommend is having chimes. In other words, bells or chimes that, that happen throughout the day, much as a, a monk in a monastery might hear a, a bell and that would call them to prayer. Well, we need reminders to breathe. We forget, we hold our breath and we get tense and we, we're shallow breathing. So we have to remember to tune into our breath. So if you assign a, an everyday occurrence uh, a chime and say, okay, I'm going to call it a chime, whatever the phone rings. And it's going to remind me to stop and breathe before I answer. Or every time I open a door, I'm going to call that a chime. Or definitely when I'm waiting uh, on the phone, when I'm waiting for somebody to answer, when I'm waiting but being put on hold or at a stop sign, think of those things as reminders to tune into your breath and that can help. All right. So, by the way, I, I chose five areas of mindfulness they're my favorite five areas there's way more than five but these are five simple areas that could, that that you can keep in mind the second one i chose is grounding in your senses um, this five four three two one grounding exercise is a very popular one uh, used for people who's, who are having trauma who are in a panic attack or 
hard or have PTSD or just plain high anxiety. And it's super simple, as you can see. You simply um, look around you and name five things you can see silently inside your head, you know, lamp, uh, picture, desk, right? But you're stopping and you're actually putting a name to them. And you're naming four things you can touch and three things you can hear. You might need to, to listen deeply to, to um, what's in the next room or what's out, outdoors or even a block away to find three things you can hear, two things that you can taste, one you can smell. And when you do that, by the time you're done, you, people are, are usually quite centered. Another thing is this spending 30 minutes taking a five minute walk that if you had a, uh, get, gone for a walk with a two year old, you know what that's like. They stop and they sense every little thing, they taste things, they, um, they touch everything and they, they are really perfectly present. Mindful eating is another way to bring mindfulness into your daily life, pausing and breathing between the bites. Um, really looking, you know, like using, you know, arranging, choosing your food with, with a really fun color balance can be fun. Using your, using your five senses as you cook and as you eat to enjoy it. Um, it slows it down and it can, can re-regulate you as well. This thing about lingering, I like to remind people that when you, um, when you smell a candle or um, when you taste something, it's really easy for us to go, oh, that tastes good, and then we're done. So the linger idea is take 20 seconds with that candle or take 20 seconds with that piece of chocolate and watch what happens that's different. Watch what happens when you spend, when you linger over your senses. It's really quite, quite a very different experience and can be very calming. So now if you're grounded in your breath and if you're grounded in your senses, you probably are in the present moment, right? You're not, you're not on automatic pilot. Our bodies evolved to use automatic pilot for things when we don't, we, don't, we don't need to relearn how to tie our shoes every single time or relearn how to drive a car. It's kind of nice to have some of those things on automatic pilot, but we don't need it as much as we use it and we use it far too much. So, um, so present, being in the present moment is a critical part of mindfulness. So what gets in the way? Well, we have challenges. And they're often our thoughts and our feelings and our thoughts and our feelings hijack us and they drag us into the past and then they drag us into the future well in the middle of a of a pandemic that's that's not going to work if we're trying to analyze the future we don't have a ton of information about the future right now for for one reason so living in the future isn't super helpful yes we have to plan we're thinking beings and we're going to plan but we do not need to plan 24 7 and obviously getting lost in the past, things that have already happened that can't be changed, is usually um, something that drags us down when we start to ruminate on it. And it's very hard to stay in the present. So what we learn how to do is we learn how to look at our thoughts and feelings differently. We're not going to try to change them because when you try to change your thoughts, what happens? You know, try not to think about an elephant, you know, that old uh, exercise. So, um, or even try to change what you're feeling. Um, it, it's pretty impossible to change what you're feeling. But what we can't do is we can change our relationship to our thoughts and our feelings by looking at them from our observer self, kind of like if you're a wildlife photographer looking at wildlife, you're the observer, and you're watching from a distance, and you're just not getting emotionally involved with them, you're just watching. Well, we can learn to watch our emotions and our thoughts that way, and it gives us a lot more sense of security and probably even mastery. Here's a wonderful exercise called You Are the Sky, which I love. I saw this on YouTube a while ago, and I've not been able to find it yet. I just remember how, what the guy said. And he started out by saying, you are the sky. 
you are uh, you are expansive, you are wide, you are deep, and there's, there's all this oxygen, and you are the sky. And the clouds are there, the clouds come, and the clouds go, and the clouds may be pink fluffy clouds and pleasant, or they may be rain clouds, or they may be storms. The clouds come, and the clouds go. And they may be thunderstorms, and they may be lightning and electrical storms, and they may be, they may be uh, torrential rains or even hurricanes. They come and they go, but you are not the clouds. You are the sky. And in the same way, our feelings and our thoughts sometimes are very disturbing and troubling and not super helpful. You know, there's a bumper sticker, uh, don't believe everything you think. Well, it's a helpful thing to remember is that just because our brains generate a lot of thoughts and feelings doesn't mean that they're all helpful or they're all really us. They just are things that our brains are trying to do to try to make sense out of the world. Out of the world. So when we learn to have a little distance from our thoughts and our feelings, just in the same way that you are the sky gives us a distance or you are a, a wildlife photographer getting a distance from your thoughts and feelings, it can give us a little bit more sense of calm and find that, that part of ourselves that is truly our core self, our core self that, that can observe the world and observe our, our own self thinking and make choices and make good intentional choices. There's another wonderful exercise you can find. This one you can find on YouTube if you were to Google uh, just just leaves on a stream. And um, the idea is that you start out with that nice belly breath and focusing all the way in and all the way out of the breaths. And then um, as your mind gets distracted and tries to pull you into worrying or whatever, you imagine a beautiful, clear crystal stream flowing beside you. And on the surface of the water are brightly colored leaves. And when you get distracted from your, from your breathing, you notice what distracted you and, and you, you can label it. You can label it thinking or worrying or planning. And you take that thought and you place it on the leaf and you watch it float away down the stream. And then you return your focus non-judgmentally back to your breath. And again, you're focusing on your breath and let's say another thought takes you away and you start to plan something else or worry about something you did in the past. Again, without judging yourself, you just put a, a word on it. Okay, that was worrying. Put that worry on another leaf and watch it float away and return to your breath work. What's important to remember is if that happens 50 times, that's okay. If that happens 500 times, that's okay. In fact, not only is it okay, it's working. That's how it works, is that we notice what our brain is doing and then we return to the breath. You're actually training your brain, you're creating a neurological pathway for your brain to be calm and focused. Every time you do that, you're actually changing your brain. So there's no failure. Many people come back from trying to do that and they say, I couldn't do it, I had too many distracting thoughts. Not, not true, that's, that's exactly how it should go. Okay, the next piece about mindfulness. Mindfulness is not judgmental. We need to judge, we need to evaluate, we need to analyze in our lives. We're advanced beings, but we don't need to do it all the time, and we do it way too much. So instead, mindfulness teaches us to approach difficulty with curiosity. You know, what is here for me in this moment? It also teaches us to observe things without judging, observe without words. Try going for a walk and observing without any words. <laughs> or go to a grocery store and try to observe without words, you know? It's so easy for us to judge about, is the line going fast enough? Or am I getting enough food? Or did they get too much or whatever? And, um, and then you start to notice, wow, I, I judge a lot. <laughs> And I didn't know I was doing that. So try, just setting that intention of trying to observe without words can be really, really helpful and calming. Now, if we're going to try to observe without judging, 
we're going to notice that we're judging ourselves an awful lot. And we're probably going to notice we're judging our very own feelings. Like I get anxious and then I get mad at myself for being anxious. Or um, I'm in grief over the pandemic, over everything that I've lost and all the people I can't see and all the futures my children can't have right now. And it's heartbreaking. And what do I do with that feeling? Those are difficult feelings. So we need to learn to turn to our very own feelings with a sense of compassion. Here's an exercise that is, um, it's a little bit of an amalgamation of, a, of some, some tips that uh, mostly from Russ Harris, who wrote The Happiness Trap, which is a wonderful book about ACT therapy. Um, so it's hold yourself kindly. So here's what you do is you bring to mind a difficult situation, something in your life that causes you distress. Maybe not choose the most traumatic right now for this moment, but choose something that's kind of difficult for you. All right, so you have that in your mind and then you drop anchor into your body instead of staying in your head about it. In other words, you feel that feeling as a physical sensation in your body and you drop the storyline you're no longer worrying about who to blame or how it happened or whose fault it is but you're just dropping that storyline and just feeling that deep in your body and your senses and you might locate the feeling somewhere specific you might say well i can really feel it in my chest it's tight or my gut just is kind of nauseous or hurts so what you do then is you put your hand very gently and very softly on that part of your body that you can feel that feeling. And again, drop in the storyline, feel the warmth of your hand, just express gentleness and warmth into your body. And maybe that warmth softens your body. And then you kind of think about breathing softness into your body right now in the middle of that emotion, whatever that was. So in that way, we're feeling the feelings without getting entrapped in a storyline. It's usually the storyline is what keeps us stuck and keeps us ruminating. And, and when you just can't get out of it, it's because we're entrapped in a storyline. So this is a really good exercise to drop that storyline, feel it in your body. Now, some feelings are so intense and so powerful. Grief, fear, I mean, it can just be overpowering. And in those cases, you might want to think about it as a wave. That wave is going to pass through your body of that feeling, and you're just going to breathe through the wave. A little bit like a labor pain. But if you think of surfing on top of the wave, you're going to surf that wave of that emotion until it passes, because it will. It will crest, and it will pass, and it will start to subside, because that's what feelings do. Just like the clouds in the sky, they come and they go. Lastly, mindfulness is, again, this is my favorite five things about mindfulness. Mindfulness is making conscious choices. It's, oh, here's a quote from Pima Chodron, who I love. She's a Buddhist nun. Yeah. To be fully alive, fully human, and completely awake is to be continually thrown out of the nest. And don't we feel that in the middle of a pandemic, boy, just like we're being uh, thrown to the wolves a little bit. <laughs> So what can we do? Well, it's difficult. It's not always easy. We can hold ourselves kindly. We can also make some conscious choices about this. Um, setting an intention can be helpful. For example, think about who do I want to be in the midst of this? How do I want to go through this? What kind of a person do I want to be as I as I walk this journey and set intentions for that. If I want to be a more patient person, maybe at the beginning of the day, set an intention to watch for opportunities to be patient. Um, if I want to be a better breather, <laughs> not be holding my breath and making myself anxious, set an intention to be watching for that during the day. We can create rituals for ourselves. Um, there's just no end to the, the kinds of rituals we can create. Um, oftentimes, people benefit from having a worry journal, which is kind of a, a way of 
setting aside, you know, 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of the day to worry, worry effectively, write it all down, and then shut that book and put it on the shelf. And then what you're doing is you're saying, it's okay for me to worry. It's just, I need to, we're, we're thinking people, we need to do that, but I don't need to do it the whole day. And now I can put it off till later in the day. We can also light a candle to remind us to pray. We can, um, some people set altars in their homes to remind them of sacred things that they hope to get back to soon. You know, maybe shells from a beach or um, pictures of loved ones that they, uh, they know that they will see sometime soon, not, not as soon as we want, but sometime. Making a gratitude list can help and studies show that having uh, the simple practice of writing three new things that you're grateful for every day just three, but they're new. Three new things every day can actually, in a measured way, um, contribute to well being. Um, embodied prayer, I just threw that in because I love um, anything that includes body work, can, can kind of help me calm down because I tend to be an anxious person. Um, whether you believe in God or not, whether you have a faith in a higher power or not, this is something that you can do to let go of burdens where you. Imagine yourself holding that burden in your hands, your hands are held palms up, and then listening to soothing music, you kind of slowly lift your hands and allow that burden to be released. Maybe it's released to the universe, maybe to your higher power, maybe even to your higher self, if, you, if whatever helps you. And then you turn your hands over and then you feel the blessing raining down. Feel that blessing raining down. Continuing to breathe, you do it again. It's rhythmic, you do it over and over. It's almost like a dance. And you can do it to music, whatever music is soothing to you until you start to feel that relief, until you start to feel that, that feeling dissipate. So, these are the five things I wanted to share with you today. Remember to breathe, be grounded in your senses, find some ways to stay in the moment, experiment with non-judging, uh, make some conscious choices. Um, I am going to stick around after this. If people have questions, you can use, there is, I believe, a, a way to, to um, give a comment on Zoom by typing in a comment. I think if you look on your screen or put your cursor at the bottom of your screen, you might see a, a way to, to enter in a, um, a question and I can hang out afterwards. But if you don't wanna hang out and you are finished, thank you for joining me. Uh, again, this is from Samaritan Counseling Center of the Fox Valley. And um, we are, have actually have another webinar next week at this exact same time. Um, my colleague Gloria will be speaking about um, locus of control, you know, what's in your control and what's out of your control, and that should be fabulous. Gloria is a wonderful speaker. So please watch for, um, watch for those, those announcements and be well. Thank you. Now for folks who are sticking around, I, if you are sticking around, I'm gonna see if there's any questions on the chat here. I see, thank you, I see a thumbs up. People saying hi to each other, that's good. <laughs> Perhaps you can all, can you all read the messages? Yeah, they're real simple. They're real simple and they're stuff we know, but sometimes you just need to hear it again and again and again because because it's so simple, because it's so obvious you don't want to do it. <laughs> Somebody asked, this was recorded, will that be shared? Uh, yes, I believe so. I believe we're gonna find it. Yep, we're gonna be able to put that um, somewhere where you'll be able to watch it again if you want or take notes or whatever. And um, I'm sure we would email you, right, Kim? Yeah. 
so the recording will be available. All right. I don't know how, if people want to speak, if they want, um, I, I wonder if I can unmute you. I don't think, yeah, like Amy Eben, I just unmuted you. Can you say hi? Hello. Yes. Okay, so I, yeah. Yes. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Sorry, I don't had to practice on you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to see if I could do that. Now I'm gonna mute you again. <laughs> Yeah, so send me a message if you want to be unmuted and need to talk. Like I said, I can stick around for a little bit. Otherwise, have a lovely day. It's gorgeous outside. Bye-bye. Hey. Hi. Hi, Mary. Can you hear me? Uh, Mary, yes, I can hear you. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, somebody else is talking. Somebody else. It's Janet. Janet. Yeah. I can't find you on the screen. Let me look. Thank you, Dee. That was a lovely. Okay. <laughs> Did you turn your. Lovely um, present. Hi. Yeah. Uh, lovely presentation. Thank you. Really good to see you and to listen to your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great to see you too. Janet, I thought of you this week because I thought of the song, How Can I Keep From Singing? And when we're being warned not to sing, it's like, oh no, we have to find other ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Great to right. see you. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I will end the presentation unless um, my unless Jane, do you have any other direction? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.